Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Amrita Shungarpure Zoshi. I'm a cardiac anesthetist and today we'll be discussing the topic uh, perioperative myocardial infarction. So, uh, for pericard uh, perioperative myocardial infarction, the well, let's uh, know a few things about the basics. Okay, so what is a normal coronary blood flow? Now, the resting coronary blood flow averages about 225 ml per minute, which is about 4 to 5 percent of the total cardiac output in a normal adult. And this blood flow increases three to four folds and maximum exercise level. By exercise, we don't mean actual physical exercise. It can be uh, anything uh, which is stress related, which equates whatever uh, output is required for exercise. Now, the, how is the coronary blood flow determined? It is the pressure gradient between the aorta and the ventricles. Because at that time, the uh, aortic valve is closed. So, uh, it is a gradient which is created between the aorta and the LV. There are phasic changes in the coronary blood flow during systole and diastole in the LV. So, like you can see in this diagram, now the blood flow falls to a low value during systole, especially in the subendocardial area. Why? Because the myocardium, the entire left ventricular wall is undergoing a contraction. So, the subendocardial vessels are compressed. So, that is why the subendocardial blood flow is decreased. It occurs maximally in the diastole when the LV is relaxed. Okay, so you can see from this diagram over here that the left coronary blood flow is highest in the diastole. Okay, the, so what? So to enhance your coronary blood flow, the aim has to be to prolong the diastolic time. The entire reason for explaining this is to tell you that the diastolic time is what matters and what is beneficial to improve the coronary blood flow. These basic changes are much less in the RV because as you know that the RV wall thickness is not as much as LV. So even during systole, the RV systole, the contraction of the RV by muscle by itself does not occlude the uh, uh, subendocardial blood. Now this is the coronary anatomy. Uh, so the coronary artery map. Okay, so this is a so there are two ostiums of the aorta. This is the left coronary ostium. This is the right. And from the left originates the left main, which bifurcates into the LAD and the LCX. And these are the branches of the LCX, OM1, OM2. This is the LAD, which has septal perforators, and these are the diagonal branches. The RCA has one acute marginal and one uh, PLV branch, posterior, left, uh, posterior branch, and one PDA, posterior descending artery. Okay, this is how your coronary angiography report will look in the file of the patient. So that is why this map is also important to understand the branching. Okay, now let us see how it looks on the heart. This is the left main. The uh, LAD is along the uh, interventricular septum. Okay, it has the diagonal branches and the septal branches. The LCX goes around the posterior atrioventricular septum. Okay, then this is your RCA, which gives the, uh, the acute marginal branch and your the posterior descending artery. Now, the uh, when do we say it's a right dominant circulation, which is uh, seen in two thirds of the people? It depends on where your PDA comes from. So, the posterior descending artery, if it is a branch of the RCA, it is called as a right dominant circulation. If it comes from the LCA, then it is called as a left dominant circulation. And if it comes from both, it is called as a co-dominant circulation. Okay. See, all this is reported in your coronary angiography. That is why I am emphasizing on all these things. So that also helps you decide, you know, later on when the patient is undergoing cardiac surgery, a CABG or stenting, which is an important vessel to graft and which not. So all these reports you'll see in the file. So just for you to get oriented. So this is one thing, the coronary anatomy. Okay, these are just basics that we'll discuss and then I'll tell you the uh, reference as to why do we need to know all these things. Now, myocardial oxygen demand. So what is the myocardial oxygen demand? It is a demand, like the, it is self-explanatory, the demand of oxygen for the heart. Okay, so what are the factors which determine the myocardial oxygen demand? So your cardiac output. Cardiac output is a product of heart rate and stroke volume. So heart rate, stroke volume and 
the wall stress okay which is given by the formula wall stress is equal to pressure into radius upon 2 into wall thickness now what is this pressure pressure is a pressure inside the ventricle ventricular volume the volume is the preload inside the ventricle which determines the radius of the lv divided by 2 into wall thickness wall thickness is the thickness of your lv okay by calculating this formula you will be able to calculate the wall stress which is a measure of the afterload the afterload against which the heart needs to pump so as you can see if your pressure inside the ventricle which will be proportionate to your volume it or and the diastolic pressure so if the pressure or your volume which is the radius increases your wall stress is going to increase if your thickness of the lv increases your wall stress is going to reduce okay why is this important see if there is an acute load if there is an acute load there is no increase in the wall thickness there is increase in the pressure there is increase in the radius so your wall stress immediately increases if there is a chronic load that means the heart has had enough time to compensate so there is compensatory hypertrophy like you can see in chronic aortic stenosis or in patients who have like like chronically hypertensive patients so in those patients the wall thickness increases to compensate for the increase in the wall stress okay systolic failure is when the increase in the pressure and the radius is more than what can be compensated okay and dilated cardiomyopathy is again the extreme stage of it okay so this is the these are the factors which help determine your myocardial oxygen demand this formula is the laplace law of the heart okay so the whenever all this is important because when you are treating heart failure your aim should be to reduce the L lv wall stress okay so basically you are trying to reduce the pressure and the volume because we can't increase the lv mass so when we are treating it we are trying to reduce the pressure and the lv volume myocardial oxygen supply that was the demand what the heart needs now where does the heart get that whatever demand it has how is it met it is by the myocardial oxygen supply which is met by the following factors now heart rate by heart rate we mean the diastolic time see we discussed the diastolic time is the time when there is coronary blood flow which ensures good coronary blood flow so you need to ensure that there is adequate diastolic time okay so your heart rate you so you cannot accept tachycardia your heart rate needs to be controlled coronary perfusion pressure the coronary perfusion pressure is given by the formula aortic diastolic blood pressure minus the left ventricular end diastolic pressure okay the difference between the two is going to determine what amount of uh, coronary perfusion pressure and the blood flow is determined by the coronary perfusion pressure divided by the coronary vascular resistance sorry so that is why the aortic diastolic blood pressure and the ventricular end diastolic blood pressure are both important for the coronary perfusion pressure okay then comes the arterial oxygen content okay the content of oxygen in the arterial blood is given by this formula whatever oxygen is bound to your hemoglobin plus whatever is the dissolved oxygen okay now for whatever oxygen is bound to your hemoglobin there are two things okay the oxygen carrying capacity into saturation oxygen carrying capacity is what 1.34 into hemoglobin now 1.34 is the maximum oxygen carrying capacity per ml uh, so uh, of the blood so ml per gram of hemoglobin okay so that is 1.39 that into the hemoglobin into the saturation will give you the uh, amount of hemoglobin bound oxygen and dissolved oxygen is given by the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood into 0.03 okay it is a solubility constant at normal temperature when you add the two you get the uh, and multiplied by the cardiac output you get the delivery of oxygen rate of oxygen delivery in ml per minute okay and then comes so this is going to give you the arterial oxygen content okay and then comes the coronary artery diameter which is going to determine your coronary vascular resistance so in patients with coronary artery disease this is going to be decreased okay so 
in tachycardia your diastolic time is going to be decreased in patients with lv diastolic dysfunction your ventricular and diastolic blood pressure increases automatically your coronary perfusion pressure decreases in conditions with anemia your hemoglobin concentration decreases so that uh, hypoxia your oxygen partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood decreases that's why all these factors which determine your oxygen supply you need to ensure are maintained okay now what is myocardial ischemia 